following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Good morning. Today, we are going to talk about the second arcanum of the tarot called the priestess, related with the letter Bet of the Hebrew alphabet, and with the number two. <coughs> really, this is a great arcanum related with the Divine Mother. Aima Elohim, the Divine Mother Kundalini, which is also called Prakriti, Maha Prakriti, which is really the womb from which everything emerges. Here, we had to explain about the binary or the duality which emerges from the unity. When the, we address or we look at the picture which you also can find in the website of the second arcanum we clearly see that all of it is related with the duality beginning with the priestess which symbolizes the divine mother Aima Elohim also the woman, the priestess itself, which between parentheses, it is good to remember that in the last lecture, the speaker explained very well that the magician and the priest is the same thing. The meaning of magician is priest. The meaning of priest is a magician. The one that exercises dominion of nature, internal and, and external nature. And obviously, when we study the priestess, we are studying the female aspect of that magician, which is the priestess, the woman. As above, so below, as below, so above. You see that there are two columns which represents men and women. 
and uh, that we are going to explain uh, for you to understand how this card is related to the universe and to the human being. The letter, <coughs> the letter bet, uh, is a letter which is the first letter that you find in the book of Genesis. Remember that Genesis comes from generation, generate, and bereshit, which is the first word uh, of the book of Genesis in Hebrew, begins with bet. And uh, the world of creation, which is the word bria, starts with bet. And bina, which is the Holy Spirit, or the third uh, sephira, begins with bet. Something that really invite us to reflect because really Bina is in relation with creation Bria with Bereshit because it is the beginning or the way in which the universe develops So then, when we explain the nature of God, we always arrive at the conclusion that God has no form. But we have to study that that people call God. Because remember that uh, in Hebrew, the first word that you find in the Bible for God is Elohim. And many times, Elohim or Elohim, we explain that it's a feminine word, Eloah. with a masculine plural ending. So when we said Elohim, we are saying gods and goddesses. But El itself is masculine. So the word Elohim written in the book of Genesis, many translators translated as God. But really, the real translation should be gods and goddesses, because it's a plural word which encompasses feminine and masculine together. So, the number one, as you know, is masculine, but the number two is feminine. The number two emerges from the unity which in reality is within the unity but the number two the duality is a way in which divinity multiplies or creates it's not possible it's impossible for the unity to create by itself it, it, it does not unfolds into two. And that's why uh, in many ways in Kabbalah you find that uh, there are different names related with different entities, different forces that always show us the duality or the two aspects, two polarities, masculine, feminine. And it is because in order for creation to exist, 
we need always the two polarities. Those people that believe in God as masculine and reject the feminine aspect of it are half atheists because God is male female. So in order for us to be a complete theist, we have to understand that we have to worship not only God as masculine, but the goddess, the divine mother, is feminine aspect, in order to be complete. Other words, I repeat, we will be half atheists, because God is male, female. And uh, this is how you find that that uh, fire, which is God, unfolds into another fire, which is the goddess. That's why Keter, or the tree of life, which is the first sephira, is uh, symbolized with the letter Yod. The letter Yod is related, as you know, with the phallus. Yod means phallus, or signifies phallus. That was everything, when you find the letter Yod, you have to be the creative potential of the masculine aspect of divinity. So then, this Yod in the Sephira Hohma, which is a Sephira that we are talking right now, because remember that the first are, uh, Sephira, Keter, is related with the, with the first uh, card of the tarot that we talk about, the magician. And the second, Sephira, Chochma, which means wisdom, obviously is related with the feminine aspect. But we have to comprehend that in this way in order to understand that every Sephiroth of this triangle that we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Keter, Chochma, Bina, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, different names in different religions, they always uh, take possession of the three triangles that we see in the tree of life in order to organize that which is the universe. The first triangle, which is the triangle that you call triangle of God, Keter, Chochma, and Bina, is controlled by Keter is the first one. But the second triangle that we find here below is controlled by Chochmah, the second Sephira. Chochmah is wisdom. And in that Sephira we find the name of God, the first, when we studied Kabbalah, for the first time we find the name of God as yod He vav He, which is translated into English as Jehovah. But the real translation should be Yod Hava. And Yod is pointing the phallus. And Hava, the womb. Because Hava is the way in which you say in Hebrew, Eve. Eva. It's how you say it in Spanish. But in Hebrew, you want to refer to that name. Is of course, uh, Hava. So when you said, <coughs> Yod Hava, in Kabbalah, you are naming masculine, feminine. So the name Jehovah is also masculine, feminine. Because the word Jah, you hear that many times, Christians repeat that word many times. Hallelujah, 
ya. And that means worship or praise. Ya. And who is ya? Ya is Keter, the first, the father. That's ya. That's his particular mantra. So when you said hallelujah, ya, you said praise the first one, the number one. Who is ya? Right? So you find that Jah in the word Jehovah. That the, the rest, Jehovah, is the feminine aspect. Jah, masculine, Hova, feminine. So that word that always you repeat, Jehovah, doesn't point a masculine entity. It's an androgynous entity. So people that think that the masculine name of God is Jehovah are wrong. Because the name Jehovah is not masculine. It's masculine, feminine. Together. That's why in Kabbalah we said, not Jehovah, we said it completely. Yod Hava. And Yod is pointing Adam. And Hava is pointing Eve. So from Adam comes Eve. As is written in Genesis. That Eve was taken from the body of Adam. If Eve was taken from the body of Adam, it's because Eve was within Adam before. So Adam was male, female. That's why it's written that God created man into his own image. Now, this is something very important to understand. Because God has no form. But God needs the form in order to abide in matter. That form, that matter within which God needs to abide is called human being or man. But here we have to explain that the word man is androgynous. We are not taking the word name as the dictionary. That it was pointing the male. When we say the word man, we are naming the female and the male together. This is something that we have to understand. Because this is how it's written. That the man was made male, female. Obviously, after that come the division. When Eve was taken from Adam. And then we find... That Adam is called man and the woman, woman, man. Which between parentheses, wo in Sanskrit means no. No man or the negative or the passive aspect of the man. Feminine aspect, the wo man. So here, God is fire. I repeat. And that's why in the Bible and many other books, when they refer to God, they always refer as fire. But that is not the common and current fire, because the fire itself has two aspects. The visible and the invisible. The visible aspect of the fire... Is this what we call matter? Has forms. In other words, matter is only the crystallization of fire. Or as we say scientifically. Matter is just the complication of the energy. Remember Einstein. He says, matter transformed into energy, energy into matter. So in the last synthesis, matter is energy. As an example, we say the physical matter that we know is a compound of cells. The cells are a compound of molecules. The molecules are a compound of atoms. If we make an explosion of an atomic bomb, we liberate energy. So in the last synthesis, all of that matter is energy. 
So whether it's water, whether it's air, whether it's uh, air, earth, in the same fire, in the last sentence, everything is fire, energy. So, but that visible part that we are talking here, which is the crystallization of the fire or the energy into many forms, is that visible aspect of the fire that we are talking. But obviously, with a physical sight or with the physical senses, we only capture the physical aspect of the fire. But there is other dimensions where there, there you find other crystallizations of that fire that we call God. But it's important to understand that, as we said in other lectures, that fire, in order to crystallize into matter, it needs the second aspect. That second aspect is what we call the akasa. What is the akasa? Is that feminine aspect of the fire, an unfoldment of the fire, but it has no form. The akasa is diluted there in the space. That akasa or fire, we will say, is what the Hindus call the prakriti, the mula prakriti, which is in the universe. From there, from that substance, emerges the worlds. Planets, moons, crystallize. So that is precisely what uh, in Kabbalah we call that, and that we were talking in the previous lecture, the Upper Eden, paradise. It's called paradise because it is the place where God is abiding as male, female. That's why the Sefira Da'at, which is a word for knowledge, Gnosis, is a place where God abides. Everything is possible within Da'at because there is where we find the activity of Chokhmah, Yod Kabar, wisdom, in Bria. And you know, Bria is creation, the world of creation, where Bina is acting. Where the Divine Mother creates. In Christianity, the Divine Mother is called Mary. People that, uh, ha, uh, that have not knowledge related with Kabbalah, which is the root of Christianity, because the great, the great uh, rabbi from Galilee, Jesus of Nazareth, was a rabbi. And he founded Christianity. <clears throat> and obviously, he knew about uh, creation. And uh, <clears throat> they knew about Aima Elohim, the Divine Mother, which was represented in his physical mother that we know is Mary. Or Miriam. Because the physical mother of Master Jesus is a great master. A great female master. It's a goddess related with the elements of nature. And 2,000 years ago, when Christianity began, she took the responsibility of representing 
the divine mother in Christianity. He uh, being her herself a priestess of the temple of Israel, he got that honor. That's why we call it Mary, the mother of God. But we understand very well that Mary, the mother of God, has no form. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, that came 2,000 years ago, yeah, she is a master. As Master Jesus is a master that represents the Christ. But Christ is universal. The Divine Mother is universal, has no form, but is represented in Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jehovah, the great master of the past Maha Mamantara or Cosmic Day, is a great master too. He's an individual, but he represents in us our own particular individual Jahava, which is inside. So then we have to understand that in Gnosticism, we do not deny these masters. They exist, but they represent something inside of us. That's the only way that we understand how to develop because Christianity unfortunately stagnant in worshiping the personality of Jehovah, the personality of Jesus, the personality of Mary. They are masters, they deserve our respect, but we have to love our God above all things and the neighbor as thyself. That's the commandment. Thyself, the neighbor, masters like Jesus, like Jehovah, like Mary, Krishna, many other gods, masters that exist, we respect. But first, we go inside because each one of them represents something within. This is how we understand. So then Mary is of course the representation, the symbol of the Divine Mother. With that fire, which is called a casa, which when crystallizes, thanks to the activity of the masculine fire that we were studying in the first arcana, the first arcanon, the magician, which is Keter, Chokmah and Binah together, uh, enters into activity in Bria. Bria, which is the world of creation. And that's why the Divine Mother, which is the duality, is between two columns. Because she needs to work. She, in herself, is one column. But if we see two columns there, it's because within Bria, within that, is her house. That is her house. Because only in her house there is creation. It cannot be creation without the mother. If a man has a sperm and wants to have a son, she needs forcibly the womb. And it is the woman that is going to take nine months in order to develop that, not the man. Of course, the sperm is necessary, which is the seed. But the woman is the one that takes all over creation. That's why in Latin, mother is called mater. And you say mother, mater. And mater, you know, in English is mater, which is mother. Because she's the original of the form. The woman, the feminine aspect, is the origin of the form. Because that sperm takes form in the womb and becomes what we are. Hmm? So the woman takes all of that within her womb in order to create what we call the human being, physically speaking. Same thing above. In that, in the space, the Divine Mother, Maha Kundalini, takes the fire of the Creator and molded 
in her womb, which is the space, and creates a planet. That's why in other lectures we talk about the Divine Mother has different aspects. Because that feminine aspect unfolds in different aspects. The first aspect is the unknowable. Even the unknowable divine needs the unknowable feminine aspect in order to exist. The unknowable divine is masculine and feminine. That's why the Ein Sof receives, from this point of view, the name of Sephirah. The word Sephirah is a feminine name. That alludes the Divine Mother, the Ein Sof, from which all the Sephiroth emerged, which is the universe. So then you find that the unknowable divine in its feminine aspect is Sephirah, the Divine Mother, that creates the universe, the Sephiroth. Now the Divine Mother as a visible aspect is called Divine Mother Nature because from the space that Mother Nature creates different planets using nature. The Divine Mother is everywhere. So the Divine Mother Nature as Eden is a four dimension. It is in the fourth dimension we find the Divine Mother Nature, which is the force, the feminine aspect of God in any single planet that creates life. Different forms of life that crystallize in the physical three-dimensional world. Now, so that's why we said that paradise, Eden, is in the fourth dimension. And when we talk about that, we pointed Yesod, which is a sexual force. Shaddai El Chai, the almighty power of God is in Yesod. But the Divine Mother needs to be there in order to create that. That's why. In the beginning, God said, there, there be light. And the Divine Mother said, and there was light. Because if she didn't say, and there was light, there is no light. Right? It's like the man says, let there be a son. And the mother says, and here is your son. Same thing. The light is the son of both. That's why it's written that mother and father are darkness and light is their son. This light is Christ. You see the beauty of all of this. But now we always emphasize that whether the father or the mother are fire, they have no form. That's why I said that. The devotee, when he is worshipping the Divine Mother, the Divine Mother can appear before him or before her by taking the shape of any religious feminine aspect of God. If she or he is a Christian, they will take the feminine aspect of Mary but if he's a Hindu, we'll take Saravasti or any other, because in Hinduism we find many feminine aspects of the goddess, of God. If uh, he or she is a worshipper of the ancient, in this case the Tarot, then she will appear like Isis. But after she appears as Isis and talks with her devotee, and the devotee receives the blessing of her Divine Mother, or his Divine Mother, she dissolves the form because she doesn't need it. But she is the origin of forms. 
That's why it is written. Then when God, the masculine aspect, being now talked to the devotee, he says, I am the one that formed you in the womb of your mother. The Holy Spirit really creates within the womb of our mother. If it wasn't for our mother, whether any religion that we follow, we won't be here. So don't forget the Divine Mother. Because her mystery is occultism. Everything related with the number two is occultism, hidden. That's why the Divine Mother is covered with a veil. Which is called the veil of Isis. Because you need to lift the veil. You have the courage. In order to lift the veil of Isis, you need telema. That means willpower. Because she hides the secret of creation. Only by being a creator, you lift that veil. And here is the secret. Because in the previous Arcanum, the speaker talks about God as air. Aleph is air. So God is air, the origin of air, that fire in air. But also is Shin, which is fire in Kabbalah. And also is Mem, mother, mutter, within which the fire abides. Because the Mem, the mutter, Ahima Elohim, is the house above is a house above in the space of God. So God has a house, and that house is the goddess, Aima Elohim. There he abides in order to create fire within fire. That's why when God wants to create his habitat, or wants to appear before anybody or in the universe, he makes the human being. The human being is precisely the last, the utmost goal of God. Because in him or in her, I was saying in him, but really the real human being is both masculine and feminine. Because if God wants to abide in the human being, first enters as feminine and then as masculine. And this is how you discover the mystery of creation. So behold here. Now the whole secret in order to become the house of God, because Bet means the house of God. Bet itself, even in Arabic, Bet is house. And it's written, a man without a house is not a man. But here you come because you don't understand the meaning, you think you need to buy a house. And then uh, you will be a man. No. It will be this in many ways. A man without a woman is not a man. Because Bet is a woman. That's the meaning of it. And a man without a house is not a man, meaning without the creation of the vehicles in order to God abide within is not a man as well. So it has many meanings, you see. But of course, literally, people do not understand Kabbalah, take just the literal. A man without a house is not a man. So he has fight all the time making money in order to buy a house. And he says, now I am a man. Or I have a house, I have a wife. Which is, of course, everybody does that. But the other meaning is different. And behold, the womb is a symbol of that, bet, that house, within which creation is made. In other words, the womb of the woman is paradise. We came out of paradise 
into this physical world to suffer. But that womb is related with the four dimension as well, symbolically. But look, observe how the fetus is developed in the womb of the woman. Is floating in the water. Because through the water receiving all those elements. In order to be developed. We're talking about the physical body. That has a shape of a human being. But the physical body really is a great creation. A great organism. That needs different forces. Elements. That the woman attracts. From her womb. And this is how it's being created. Elements from the megalocosmos. Elements from the macrocosmos. Elements from nature. In order to create the microcosmos. The human body. That's why the human body is called the negative aspect of the spirit because the spirit has no form but the physical body has form that's why when we talk about the spirit our own individual particular spirit which is Hesed we find that his negative aspect is Malkut the physical body in Malkut in the, in, from this point of view, it's feminine. Whether you are man or woman. That's why in Malkut, we find the queen. And the physical body is polarized negatively. That's why we have to work. This is the work of the spirit. Hesed, the innermost, has to command nature. Has to command the Holy Spirit. But it's written that the physical body being the house of God, the temple of God, has become a, a den of thieves. This is how Jesus says. Because obviously the physical body was created by the powers of God. Because only God can create. But we have transformed the temple of God, the physical body, into a den of thieves. And that's why Jesus, 2,000 years ago, symbolically, when he entered into the temple, he took a whip and whipped out all the merchants. Those merchants, of course, are the ego. Or the egos that we have within. Because the temple of God is called a house of prayer. But we have transformed the temple of God, the physical body, into a den of thieves, merchants. Is not the temple there in Jerusalem or any church of any other place or any synagogue or any mesquite that Jesus was talking to? We're talking about the temple of his body. Because that body was made in the womb for a purpose. It was floating in mem, in that liquid within the womb. But also needs the air. And that's why the navel. The umbilical cord receives, has uh, four arteries within, the four channels. Two are for the air, in order for the fetus to breathe, because the fetus cannot breathe through, the, uh, through his nose. If he does it, he will be dead, because then the liquid will enter into his nostrils. So the air that will nourish his lungs enters through the umbilical cord. And the blood to all the, the two, two arteries. So that's the, the navel. Or the, or the, two, the umbilical cord has four arteries. Two for blood and two for air. Aleph is air. And the blood is fire. Shin. So we hold here the three aspects of alchemy. Shin, fire. Mem, water. And air, Aleph, creating Adam. Physically speaking, the physical body, which is Malkut, because the three primary forces 
of these three letters always create. Mm -hmm. This is how you find, that's why we said that from Eden, it says, or upper Eden came a river that was nourishing paradise, Eden. And that's why we insist always that the physical body is paradise as well for us, coming from paradise. And unfortunately, we have transformed paradise into a hell because we don't know how to take advantage of it. The blood that enters into the organism at the end with all the transformation that we already talked about in other lectures becomes sperm. So that fire that comes from above through the blood becomes sperm in the man and ovum in the woman. But the blood is also coming milk in the breast of the woman. That's why you see that the priestess that represents the priestess of the Divine Mother has the Tao cross pointing to her breast. Showing you that you have to be nourished with wisdom. With virtues. As the fetid needs the milk of the mother, also we need that milk, that wisdom. She is the Divine Mother too. In order to develop. But in order to develop, we need to work with the Divine Mother. We need to worship. And the science of the Divine Mother is called alchemy. That's right, the great mystery of the great arcanum is precisely sexual transmutation. Because in the duality abides the Divine Mother. Man is the positive, woman the negative, or masculine and feminine. So in order to create, we need the two polarities. Sperm in the ovum, that's called alchemy. We are not going to teach here how to create physically. Because everybody knows about it. But how to create inside, within, or as Jesus of Nazareth said 2,000 years ago, to be born again by the fire and the water. Or by the water and the spirit. Water is mem, the feminine aspect. The spirit is the masculine aspect. It's an alchemical statement. It's not something that we have to believe in. Because nobody comes into this physical world by believing. And this is precisely the aspect of the mystery of the Immaculate Conception. Because Christians ignore about that. It says that Mary was conceived by the grace and action of the Holy Spirit. That is alchemy doesn't mean that she didn't have sex. It means that she had sex, but in mystery, in immaculate conception, without uh, impurity. Because immaculate means purity. The sexual act in itself is necessary for creation to exist. But Mary gives us the mystery there, the example. That in order to become a twice born or a Christian, in order to be God Jesus, she needs to be fecundated, immaculate, in the immaculate way. We are, of course, the outcome. Or the fecundation of our father and mother. But that is not immaculate. Unfortunately we were born through fornication. Which means through the animal generation. Because fornication is the sexual act with spasm or orgasm. 
That's fornication. No matter if we believe in anything. If the sperm, if the couple reaches the spasm or the orgasm, they are fornicators. So all of us are children of fornication. But to be born again as an immaculate conception means that we should take advantage of the duality. Bina, Bet, the house of God. In this case, the man has to penetrate in the house of God, which is the woman, and not to damage or how you call to pollute the house of God. Animals pollute the house of God because they are irrational. They don't know. But the human being knows how to transmute the sexual force. And that's why the master emphasizes and says, Do not forget, you, man, that your woman is your priestess that represents your divine mother. Of course, our physical mother also represents the divine mother. Of course, our sister also represents the Divine Mother. Of course, our female friends also represent the Divine Mother. Because the Divine Mother has different aspects. So the feminine aspect of the, of the Mother of God is a woman. Made into the image of the Goddess. So therefore, to be born again, to make the house of God... Is to create the internal bodies. To enter into the world of Bria. The mystery of creation. And that's why the letter Bet is written. It's made by three baths. One here, horizontal. Which descends into another bath. Which is vertical. Holded by another bath. Which is horizontal in the very bottom. Three. Why three? Because we need three men inside of us. The three men are the three solar bodies that we need to create. <coughs> because a man without a house is not a man. In our house are the vehicles within God has to abide. The astral body is the house of the sun. The mental body, solar body, is the house of the mental solar body. The house of the, of the Holy Spirit. And the causal body is the house of the Father. Because when somebody has a causal body, he says, this man can do the will of God. Because the body of willpower or the body of council body is a body through when we learn how to do the will of the Father. So we hold council body, the Father, mental body, the Holy Spirit, because in the mental body we have all the powers of the Holy Spirit, solar body. And the astral body is the sun in us. So those three men or valves. Are the three internal bodies that we have to create in order to become a man, a human being. Then we'll become a righteous man. That's why in Kabbalah they said that there are 36 righteous men in the earth. But that's a symbol. Three plus six are nine. Meaning that in order to become a righteous man, a right human being, we have to create the bodies. The three bodies. Or the letter Bet. And to make a house of God. Then we are ready. To incarnate God. But when the house is ready. Jesus has to come. Which is Christ. Which is also fire. And to incarnate in the Bodhisattva. And to take with the whip. Out the ego. Little by little. Out of the house of God. In order to that man to become. A resurrected man. And only a resurrected man could be really the house of God. Because the many aspects of divinity have to incarnate. Because that's the meaning of creation. God needs a house. Why does a God need a house? 
because he needs a form in the universe. He needs to know his qualities, and for that he's in the, in the house. To adorn that house, to make that house according to his own idiosyncrasy. That's why each of us, spiritually speaking, has a different idiosyncrasy. And then we develop that idiosyncrasy, which is spiritual, psychological, etc., our own inheritance. And we become masters. Masters of our own house. And then we become vehicles of divinity. This is how in Kabbalah called the Sadikim. The Sadikim are those that have astral, mental, and causal body. But the real Sadikim is the one that is a resurrected master, that is a vehicle of divinity, and then can express divinity and bless, give the blessings of God through him. Moses is a Sadikim. Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Zoroaster, and many other masters, vehicles of divinity. And that's why they are the head of houses, but in this case, of big houses that people call religion. Christianity is a big house, and the head of that house is Jesus. But because he is a resurrected master, Muhammad also made a big house. And that's called Islam. But because he is a resurrected master. Buddha also made a big house. Other nations comes and make small houses. Because they are not resurrected. So they are not, uh, how you call, uh, succeed. They don't, they don't succeed like the, the great masters, resurrected masters. They had the little hull there, how you call the hut, little hut, right? Like, for instance, uh, because there are different type of houses, right? Or we would say organizations. But because a resurrected master is the only one that can channel the Holy Trinity and to bless anyone that enters into his house. When you enter into this Gnostic movement, you enter into the house of Samael on the or the red Christ of Aquarius. So then you had to enjoy all of the blessings of Samael on the or when you enter here. Samael on the or has a temple in the internal worlds. It's a big temple. And anyone that enters and to listen lectures, he enters into that temple internally. But that temple has many rooms, has his altar, has many uh, floors. It depends in which level you are. And then you are guided because in that temple of the Logos, Samael, which is Samael, uh, guided by Samael on the earth, his son, there are also other masters there. It's not only him that are assisting him because that house is a house that the white light says, Samael on the or, your house, we need your house now. Why? Because we have to give the living the knowledge of, of the Aquarian message, the Aquarian era. So are you willing to open the doors of your house and to allow all the souls that want to receive the knowledge? Because we want to deliver the knowledge of the era of Aquarius in your home. And the master says, welcome, my temple is big. And then says, send your son to the earth and teach. And anybody that comes is welcome. So therefore, you see, the cosmic Christ is working in that house in this era. So anybody from any religion that wants to enjoy the forces of the cosmic Christ enters into the house of Samael in this Aquarian age. His house is big. But each one of us has to make his own house too. Because he is teaching, he uh, as an engineer or architect, 
He's teaching you, okay, this is my temple, but you have to make your own. I will teach you here. Come anytime. And that's why Solomon called Hiram Aviv to make his temple. Because he knew how. And then after that, he had his own temple. He learned and taught others to make their own temple. To make their, to begin to make their own temple, you have to create astral, mental, and causal body. And for that, you need the mystery of the great arcanum, which is the secret of the divine mother. That's why the two columns represent the two polarities. Because the Divine Mother, as fire, who creates, rises in the spinal column. And that's why any temple enters, always has two columns. When you arrive at any temple, whether the temple of Samael, whether the temple of Raphael, whether the temple of any temple in the galaxy, in the universe, you find always, at the very entrance, two columns. Jaquin Boaz. The man and the woman, the two polarities. Because for any temple to exist, need two columns. No one, two. For creation. This is Bina, Bria, creation. Bet. The man and the woman. And it's precisely in the sexual act, by taking advantage of paradise, by Eden which is the sexual force, how the Divine Mother emerges from Eden, because the Divine Mother is in Eden. Eden is a word which means voluptuousness. Sexual voluptuousness. So in order to create something divine, you need to enter into Eden. And the entrance of Eden is a sexual act. So men and women United in the sexual act, are in Eden. That's why they are in paradise. They are, precisely the sexual act, is the most beautiful gift to the human being. But unfortunately, people do not take advantage of Eden. They enter into Eden and they leave Eden all the time. To remain into Eden is to keep the sexual force, not to spill it like the animals. To transmute it in order for the Divine Mother, who is the Creator, that needs to be fecundated by the Holy Spirit, rises in your spinal column. Which is the two columns. That's why you say two columns. Because the, 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 the woman has his, her spinal column and the man his spinal column too. But below the priestess you see two columns too. In the waters. Those two columns are in the waters. Because we need to put it up. And obviously. That columns have four. Uh, levels. Each level represents. The four bodies of sins. And the four, four levels. The four bodies of sins. Which anybody has. The physical body, the vital body, kamarupa, and inferior manas. Meaning, all of those are animal aspects. First, the physical body is a negative aspect or lunar aspect. The vital body as well. We behave negatively. Kamarupa means body of desires, which is inside. It's an emotional aspect. And the inferior manas, the mind, which is animal mind, is also inferior. So you find those four uh, levels there of that column in each side is because men and women both have four bodies of sin. Or four animal lunar forces that we have to transform into solar. Transforming into solar when we know how to take advantage of the solar light in the sexual alchemy. And then we create the internal bodies. And this is how we need the forces of the womb 
the woman needs a man in order to take advantage of, the, of, of her forces that are in her womb and to be born again. It's coming into my mind, Madame Blavatsky, this great uh, yogi, she wrote the uh, secret doctrine and she developed a lot of powers because she was a yogi, was guided by the masters. But at a certain age, the master called her and said, Madame Blavatsky, you are a great seer. You have developed a lot of spiritual powers. But you need to be born again. You need to develop your house, your internal bodies. And then she was married with a Colonel Olcott in order to perform the duality. And thanks to the Colonel Olcott, the Divine Mother, uh, Madame Blavatsky became a master of mayor mysteries, created her solar bodies. So there are many groups in this day and age, many organizations that teach you how to develop this or that spiritual force, psychological force, which is good. But if they don't teach you how to build your house, it's worthless. Because God needs to abide within you. God cannot abide within you if you don't have astral, mental, and causal solar bodies. That's why you see the two columns with the four levels of the bodies of sins are below. Only the two columns above can hold the house of God. And that is the mystery of the second arcanum. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Yeah. Bethlehem. It's a word which begins with bet. You see, bet means house. But lehem is bread. So you said Bethlehem, you said the house of the bread. But of course, this bread is not referring to the physical bread that you make with wheat, which is a symbol. Because even the wheat, the symbol of that uh, grain that encloses the fire. That's why the Eucharist is related with this occult or hidden wisdom. Because within the wit is hidden the fire of God, which when the priest and the priestess know how to transform, they free the energy in order to feed their souls. That's the mystery of the Eucharist, in which the priest, together with the priestess, liberate that fire from the bread and the wine. That's the mystery of sexual alchemy. That, mean that, that means that a priest without a priestess is not a priest. It's half. For a priest to be really a priest needs a priestess. For a man to be a man needs a woman. From God to be a God needs a goddess. This is the duality. You cannot escape from it. That's why in any ritual in the bed of house of God, which will be any church, any mesquite, or anything when you celebrate the Eucharist, the priest has to be <coughs> together with the priestess in order to perform that. Because God is not only half. You have to bring the whole entity of God within. And that's the bed. The lehem, the wisdom, because in this case, that lehem, bread, also represents wisdom. Remember that the Master Samael on the Lord talks about the super substantial bread of heaven, the manna that comes from heaven in order to feed you. Right? That wisdom is a bread. Is precisely uh, the energy of God that descends from above in order to feed you. 
And that's precisely the meaning of Bethlehem. This is a special practice that we place there <coughs> in the internet in order for you to take advantage of your sexual force. There are many Gnostics, beginners, that ask us, how do we transmute the sexual energy? The Master Samael on the Earth delivered for us from the ancient uh, mysteries of Egypt a beautiful, powerful prayer, invocation, that men and women can chant, perform, while in the sexual act, in order to transmute the sexual energy. Because really, before saying this, is coming into my mind immediately here, everything that comes into the mind has to be uttered. I remember the Master Samael, when he was passing his processes of resurrection. And he was in bed listening noise in the street. And he asked, what is that noise in the street? He says, oh, it's just the people. Because today uh, they are celebrating uh, the day of the uh, Virgin of Guadalupe. You know, Mexicans uh, worship the Virgin of Guadalupe which is a dark virgin. The master says in his bed, he said, well, really, the divine mother has to be worshipped. But unfortunately, multitudes ignore that the best way to worship the divine mother is in the sexual alchemy. Of course, any single a bachelor or bachelorette that transmute their sexual energy, worship the Divine Mother. But the, out, the utmost way to worship the Divine Mother is in the sexual act, because it's where she is. In that moment, she is acting, active. And of course, the practitioners of sexual magic should memorize this prayer and to transmute and to, and to utter this prayer during the sexual act. And then the Divine Mother will take all her energy out of the sexual organs and rise it in the spinal column. In the column of Jaquin and Boaz. And to begin the creation of the house of God. Because a man without a house is not a man. But that man when entered to the house... He has to obey his woman. A man that says, oh, I am the man of this house. Well, I always see that the woman is the boss. The man creates it, but the woman commands her. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. So let me now chant for you, or to read for you, the way in which you have to and tone this invocation while the sexual act or if you are single transmute, uh, transmuting you have to do it as well it, ha it works whether single or merry you have to say concentration of course in your divine mother kundalini be thou O hadith my secret the Gnostic mystery of my being the central point of my connection, my heart itself, and bloom on my fertile lips made verb. Up above, in the infinite heavens, in the profound height of the unknowable, the incessant glow of light is the naked beauty of Nut. She reclines. She bends in delectable ecstasy to receive the kiss of secret fervor of Hadith. The green sphere and the blue of the sky are mine. Oh, wow. 
Jakov, na konca. These mantras have the power of transmuting our sexual energy into light and fire within the alchemical laboratory of the human body. This prayer with its mantras can be utilized in sexual magic. This prayer with its mantras is an omnipotent clue in order to meditate upon our, our Divine Mother. So there you have, and if you do that, you will receive the blessings of Hava, Aima Elohim, the Divine Mother Adonia. Because each one of us has their own particular individual mother. Nobody can be here without a mother. To exist without a mother is impossible. You have questions? Well, uh, always the feminine aspect comes from the masculine aspect. That's why it is written that, Ad, uh, that Eve was coming from, from Adam. That, that's, that, that's the point, because in order to create, we need the feminine aspect. But your question is, why it doesn't say that, that the man was coming from, from the woman? The reality is that Adam is not a man from the masculine aspect. Adam is here androgynous. So the idea of people is that, or the, the idea that they have is that the woman was taken from the male. No. The male didn't exist until the woman was taken from the androgynous. Adam, in other words, is the name from the androgynous, male-female. So in the beginning, what, when, when Aima Elohim and, and God created the human being, the human being was androgynous. And the name of that androgynous being was Adam. For from that androgynous being, Eve, Chava, was taken out. So then, when Chava was taken out, and then you find the two polarities, masculine, feminine. So it's not like the people say, oh, why the woman was taken from the man? And why not vice versa? No, because if you see physically, literally, all of us come from a woman. Whether a man or whether a woman come from the womb of a female. That is the mother, right? So that is a reality. So we have to understand that that Adam, that uh, is written in Genesis, was not a masculine person, but an androgynous, with two polarities, masculine and feminine, at the same time. That's the answer. You have any other question? That is not a piece of paper, but a book that represents wisdom. That is Kabbalah. That means in order to be or to receive Kabbalah, 
you have to enter into the mysteries of Da'at, of Bina, Bria. So, in this case, we have to state there are two types of Kabbalists. Intellectual Kabbalists that memorize the Sephiroth and that talk about and write books and intuitive Kabbalists which are the ones that enter into the womb of the Divine Mother. In order to receive the true Kabbalah, because you know the word Kabbalah comes from Kabel, which means to receive. In order to receive the wisdom, that's why she is there with, with the book, you have to enter into her house. And her house is hidden, the sexual voluptuousness. You have to transmute that energy in order for her to give you. And then you receive, you take Kabel, Kabbalah, the real wisdom, the real knowledge, Gnosis. Of course, in the beginning, you need to know about it. That's why we are teaching this. The first type of Kabbalah is the first intellectual. You learn it, you study it, but then you have to practice it. That's why this course of Kabbalah is together with practices. The first practice that we gave in the last lecture was the sign of the infinite in order to enter into the astral plane. For there, being the astral plane, then you pray to your Divine Mother, Divine Mother of mine, take me to your home, to your house, teach me. There she is. And then you receive knowledge because really the real knowledge comes from her. Because she is the Kundalini that develops in the spinal column. She has the powers. She has, she has everything. We need to be devoured by the serpent. The serpent is one of the symbols in Hinduism for the Divine Mother. But remember that the negative aspect of the Divine Mother, because she's a feminine, is the harlot. That we have to defeat. That is called lust. The fire of lust. Which is in each one of us. In other words. The mechanicity of nature. Which works in the animal. Because animal follow lust. In certain periods of time. When they are in heat. They multiply. But they are irrational. They just obey their instincts. Now we are intellectual. But we have to overcome that nature and to create another one. To be born again, in other words. Because right now, still we are animals. Intellectual, but animals. And remember that animal comes from Latin, anima, which means soul. Intellectual souls, because we have a body. That belongs to nature. But we have to create that. And others. That is to transform the moon into a sun. As you end. Um, can, can transmutation occur without love? I'm talking about the sexual alchemy. But it's not a mechanical process, is it? It's not, it's not mechanical. The Divine Mother... Uh, is guided by the fires of the heart. And obviously we have to love. At least in the beginning we have 3% of love. That's why we always say the couple should be united physically. Meaning that they should like each other physically. Emotionally. They should like also emotionally united. Mentally are to be always same uh, beliefs, same mind. There are, for instance, couples that where the woman has one religion and the man another religion. That's, they are not united in the mind. But when both follow the same, they are united. Right? And another one is, for instance, uh, in the will, the body, of, uh, in the world of will. Both of them have to have the same will, the same goals. Together, they have to work with the same 
objective. In this case, for instance, to be born again. Because remember very well that willpower expresses in the sexual act a sexual potency. That's why we said that our lemma, our motto is telema, willpower. But that works exactly in the sexual act. Because in the sexual act is where men and women with telema, with willpower, transmit the sexual energy. And then they are being born again. And for that, this is how love develops. Because the Divine Mother is love. In this case, we will say, the father, as father, is wisdom. And the mother, as mother, is love. So, of course, the Divine Mother enjoys the couples that love each other. And where true love exists in the four worlds. Physical, emotional, mental, causal. No. Obviously, we always emphasize that that because the beginning of creation without a woman we cannot create, but doesn't mean that we cannot do anything without the couple. Because there are a lot of Gnostics that are single, bachelors and bachelorettes that are working very hard with their divine mother, because the fact that we don't have a spouse doesn't mean that divine mother is not there. You have a mother whether you are single or married. Right? Physically speaking, as well internally. The Divine Mother is always there and blesses her children, whether they are single or married. But obviously, the Divine Mother uh, takes her children at a certain limit when they are single. When they reach that limit, the Divine Mother will tell her children, okay, my son or my daughter, now, if you need to keep ahead, you need to marry down there in order to keep helping you. That's why that uh, invocation that we pronounce here is good, whether we are married or single, in order to transmute the sexual energy. But of course, the self-realization of the being is only possible with the duality, the couples, men and women. Because as a single, we, you just advance at a certain level. And into my mind also comes in this very moment, Yogananda. Yogananda is a great disciple of the White Lodge. He worked a lot with his Divine Mother. If you read his writings, you will see how he, he worships the Divine Mother all the time. And he developed a lot and a lot of ego and a walk. And after death, that he died in a Maha Samadhi. After death, he was in limbo, awakened. But he thought that he was self-realized because he was fully awakened with, with, with powers. Then the Master Samael said, no, you are not self-realized. You need to be born again. You are awakened, that's good, but you need to build your bodies. But Yogananda thought, because he was developing, as you see, it's possible to develop a lot being a single. And because he was developing so much that he thought that self-realization could be attained only single. Now, he has to be born again in order to create his internal bodies. Which will be easier for him, of course, because he's awakened. He has annihilated a lot of ego. So for the single people, good to annihilate a lot of ego and to advance. But, uh, of course, it's better to be married. If that time, or, or he will, it will come. It will come. It will come. Sooner or later. Because there is always a couple for everybody. If you are single now, it's because you need to be like that. But when you need to be married, your couple will be there with a whip 
And then you have to accept it. <laughs> you have to accept it. Accept her. Or well, accept him. It's karma. I mean, I'm sure a majority of it is karma too. You know? Everything is karmic. Even the marriages. Karma is karma. The universe exists because of karma. You see? There is not a single thing that doesn't exist because of karma. Hmm? Well, that's because ego. No, no, I'm saying to find a spouse. If I'm interested in a Catholic woman, right? It seems like we're, we should wait for a Gnostic you know, woman to, or a man to come in into the religion for us to have that spouse. No, no that, that's, that's a wrong idea. You said we, religion before? We need, uh, we, we, we need of course, uh, a partner, but doesn't mean that forcibly... The partner has to be, uh, how you call it, from, from our own. Obviously, when you met a woman, you have to talk about knowledge, etc., and she accepts the, the doctrine, obviously you are done. Right? But unfortunately, it has to come here. Or if you find it here, Gnosticism will be good. Right? But there are many women there that like this knowledge, and still, they didn't hear about it. But they will. And maybe it will be through your lips. Yeah. The conflict comes, I think, when you say that, in that if they try to oppose you in it. That's where the conflict comes. For example, if somebody, if, if you, you know, you're in a relationship with someone and they don't want to help you in any way or they try to stop you from your own belief, that's where two different religions really conflict. Yeah, that, that's the problem. When I, I mean, you can have two different religions, and if they respect, if that person respects your beliefs, that's what the bottom line comes in. Listen, when I said different, when I said different religions, I said in the sense that uh, they think they are different, but there is no difference between religions, because in this sense, we can say Gnostics, we understand all religions. For me, it's not a problem. A Catholic, a Muslim, a Jew, a Buddhist. For me, it's the same. But for them, it's different. There's a big difference in fornication. Well, that's the difference. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Fornication and chastity. That's the difference. The internal religion transmute. The external, they have problems because they fornicate. They have their own habitat. They defend their own territory like animals. But a real initiate understands everything and comprehends. That all religions are pearls of the great necklace of divinity. No problem. But outside there is problem. Because obviously, I accept all religions. I love all religions. But when I talk with religious people, they think there is difference. And they said, no. If you want to be saved, you have to be Muslim. I said, why? Christian is the same thing. No, it's not the same. The same with the Jews. The same with Buddhists. A true Gnostic understands that all religions are good. Because all religions are coming from Aima Elohim, Adonia, the Divine Mother. I would like to know if any of you comes from the air. Yeah. Everybody came from a womb. And that's why we had to worship Mary. Isis, Isoberta, Rhea, Sibeles, Tonantzin. Do you have any other question? If there is no other question, we thank you for your attention. And uh, next lecture will be the third arcanum of the tarot. Thank you very much. <laughs>
All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.